Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Good to see you. Good to be here. How, how, yeah, how has the MCO treating you so far? Uh, well, <laughs> I, we, we're all dealing with it the best we can. Yeah. Uh, we oh. are already back at work. Some of us are back mm -hmm. at work. Some of mm -hmm. the teachers, uh, most of the teachers at APC are just teaching from home because yeah. it's fully online. Uh, okay. But yes, it, it's been okay. Uh, it's been okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Daniel, do you mind us uh, speaking louder? I think it might be a little bit soft. Okay. Okay. Can oh, right. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. So I think we can begin with our session. Let me just talk to the audience. Welcome back to our webinar series, part of the Edu Advisor Virtual Education Fair, where academicians and industry professionals will be weighing in on a number of topics, ranging from choosing an education pathway to jobs and careers. My name is Nina. And today we have Mr. Dino Abhishegam, the Academic Director of ATC, who will be sharing with us about studying law at ATC. So just a little quick background about our esteemed speaker today. Uh, Mr. Dino Abhishegam has been in the legal education in a variety of capacity since 2003. After a stint as an advocate and solicitor of the High Court of Malaya, he turned to education full-time. Mr. Abhishegam has taught in a variety of institutions including regular spots at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University B, Singapore's ITC School of Law, and is now the Academic Director of ATC. While his primary function is education management, he still finds time to teach as it is his primary passion. So thank you, Mr. Daniel, for joining us today. Um, to our audience who are live watching right now, if you have any questions for Mr. Daniel, please do leave a comment either on Facebook or YouTube or even, all, or even on our fair, or we'll get them answered at the end of the session. And don't forget to check out ATC's virtual booth while you're at the fair. So, Mr. Daniel, have you got your slides ready? Shall we share them now? Okay. Uh, yeah, let me share them. Yes. You just uh, click share screen. Yeah, okay. okay. All right. Me? Yes, it is now. <laughs> okay, okay so without further ado, Mr. Daniel, you may go ahead and present your presentation. Okay, hi, uh, everybody. My name is, uh, as, as announced, my name is uh, Daniel uh, Abhishegam, and I am the Academic Director and Senior Lecturer at ATC. And today, I just wanted to talk to uh, all of you about uh, generally studying for a law degree and also studying for a law degree at ATC. Now, straight away, uh, when you say studying for a law degree, a degree in law, uh, immediately what comes to mind is that uh, the end result is that uh, you will be a lawyer. Now, obviously, a lot of uh, people who do study for law degrees go on to become lawyers. But uh, I, I thought I'd start off by telling you that... Uh, when you do study for a law degree, uh, being a lawyer is not the only end result. Being, the, being a lawyer is not the only career option that you have, right? So as you can see uh, in this slide, uh, obviously you can be a lawyer, uh, a public prosecutor or a federal counsel. Now in Malaysia, a, a deputy public pro prosecutor, a DPP or a federal counsel, these are what colloquially are known as uh, government lawyers. So you do the prosecution if you are the DPP, the deputy public prosecutor, you do prosecution uh, for all uh, crimes, right? That are charges, charges that are brought up against a person. Uh, one party will do the prosecution and the other does the defending. So you will do the prosecution. So you, you work for the AG's chambers, right? Similarly with the federal counsel or a senior federal counsel, what you do is you defend the government against uh, any lawsuits or action that is taken against the government, right? Uh, but apart from that, right, you can also become what is known as a general counsel or in, uh, work in an in-house uh, legal department, right? This is, for example, if you are working for, let's say, Shell or, or Petronas or, or, or CIMB Bank or, or, or any one of those companies, these most big companies and, you know, medium-sized companies will have a legal department. So what you do is you work for that particular company, you are an employee of that company, and your role is to advise 
that company about uh, their legal liability. Your role is to advise that company about uh, what they can do and uh, what they can't do, right? Uh, journalism, right? Journalism is, uh, of course, something uh, very popular as well. Uh, lots of news uh, relates to um, law, right? You, 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 you report on political matters, constitutional matters. You report on crime. You report on court cases, right? So an understanding of the law uh, usually helps with you being able to um, uh, write your article well, right? Uh, HR departments, HR departments also very well sought after. Uh, they, well, they, they seek out for law degree holders because the HR department is the department that does the uh, hiring, the firing, the uh, contracts, the uh, disciplinary action, and, and this is all very closely related to law. Police officers, yeah, uh, they, they, they are the ones that uh, execute the law, correct? Right? So uh, they, they having a good knowledge of the law is also useful. Lecturer, this is what I do, consultants, general management as well. Uh, a lot of companies are very, uh, well, the skills you develop, right? The skills you develop as a lawyer is somewhat uh, sought after, right? Because of the analytical thinking, the, the um, ability to solve problems. And these are skills that are inculcated during the course of you getting your law degree. So apart from sticking strictly to being a lawyer, you can also, or legal work, you can also bring those skills into other areas. You can bring those skills into um, general management and things like that, and it will be useful. And the last thing that I put in this slide is a compliance and uh, regulatory uh, uh, departments, right? Compliance and regulatory departments. These are, you, they, they, they definitely are departments like this in banks, insurance companies, usually financial institutions, uh, insurance institutions um, heavily heavily regulated by the government to ensure that uh, there is no um, cheating right so your role will be to work in these departments for the bank for the insurance company to ensure that they don't fall foul of the law right your role is to advise them to make sure that everything they do is uh, strictly within the law okay now look uh, I could go on and on, but uh, these are just some of the uh, other careers that you could uh, that you could um, pursue after a law degree. Now, the reason why I wanted to start off with this is quite simply this, right? A lot of people immediately when they find out, oh, this is a talk about a law degree, that means you're going to be a lawyer, they get turned off. Turned off in the sense that, uh, look, I, I don't think I have the personality for law. I don't think I am someone that can speak well. I don't think I am someone that is um, that is able to go to court and argue a case and things like that, right? Look, if that is not your personality and you are sure, then a law degree also gives you an avenue to do so much more. That's the point. That's our starting point for today. That's the, that's the initial... Um, uh, point I wanted to make, right? A law degree is not just to be a lawyer. A law degree gives you the skills, uh, inculcates you with uh, the ability to do a wide range of things. And the, the training that you get in a law degree is useful for so many uh, other areas as well, right? Now, uh, let's move on very quickly. Uh, let's. Uh, the rest of the talk is going to be focused on... Uh, if you want to be a lawyer in Malaysia, right? Uh, so that's why I started off with all the other things that you can do. But the rest of this session, we are going to be focusing on uh, what it's, uh, how, how to be a lawyer in Malaysia, what does it take, what are the regulatory requirements, and what are some uh, myths associated with being uh, a lawyer or becoming a lawyer. Right. So in Malaysia, there are three ways, right? Three ways to get into the legal profession generally. Uh, firstly, as you can see right on top, uh, you have a recognized Malaysian law degree. Now, these Malaysian law degrees you can get from uh, our public universities, which are, uh, I mean, everybody knows, I'm sure, UM, University of Malaya, UKM, uh, 
uh, UNISA, uh, USIM, University of Science, Islam, Malaysia, uh, UIA, University of Islam, Antarabangsa, uh, UITM, right, University of uh, Technology, Mara. So these are all uh, universities that offer Malaysian law degrees. They will usually be four-year degrees, um, and then you can go on to, to complete your, I mean, after you complete the four-year degree, you can go directly into pupillage. Now, I will talk a little bit more about pupillage, but just so that I don't uh, leave you uh, uh, hanging at this moment, let me just very quickly explain what is pupillage. Pupillage is uh, for the legal profession after you have finished all the academic studying, the academic part of your education, uh, for lawyers, you must spend a certain time working with a senior lawyer before you can be called to the bar, before you can become uh, a practicing uh, lawyer, right? So the pupillage bit in Malaysia is that you must work for a senior lawyer, and a senior lawyer is defined as at least seven years or more, right, uh, of experience at the bar. So uh, with the senior lawyer, then what will happen is you work for him for nine months, and once he is satisfied that you have uh, attained all the necessary skills, uh, practical skills that you need to, to, to be a lawyer, then he will sign off on your papers and then you will be a lawyer. So that's pupillage. So coming back to, these, uh, to the chart that we have here, right? So if you have done a Malaysian law degree and you complete four years, you can go straight into pupillage. Now, the next option is the certificate in legal practice. Now, the certificate in legal practice is an exam for all foreign law graduates. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to focus on this second uh, limb. The second limb is what is the route that you will be taking with us at ATC if you choose to join us, right? The second route is this. You start off with a foreign law degree, a recognized foreign law degree. So, at ATC, we offer you the University of London degree, uh, the Bachelor of Laws from the University of London. And uh, once you complete that, that takes three years. After that, you do one year of the certificate in legal practice, right, where you learn a Malaysian court procedure, uh, a little bit of evidence, a little bit of professional practice and things like that. Then once you're done with that, then you go into pupillage. So it's three years of the degree. Right? If you're doing a three-year UK degree, it's three years of the degree, one year to do the CLP, and then you get into the Malaysian bar. Oh, no, sorry, then you get into pupillage. Yeah, what am I saying, right? You get into pupillage, and once you're done with pupillage, you get into the Malaysian bar. Okay, the third route, uh, apart from CLP, is uh, being qualified as a barrister in the UK. So this is the UK bar qualification, right? Uh, commonly known as the BPTC course. So this route is similar in that you have to do a UK law degree for three years, but after the three-year law degree, instead of going on to do the Malaysian CLP exam, what you do is then you go on to do the uh, UK bar exams, right? The UK bar exams. And this is also an available route if you do join us uh, uh, at ATC. The thing is, we, we don't offer, we can't offer the UK bar course, obviously. So after you finish the degree with us, then you will go on to do the UK bar exam in the UK. So, ladies and gentlemen, these are the three routes into the legal pro uh, profession in Malaysia. Uh, either a recognized Malaysian law degree, a four-year Malaysian law degree, uh, a UK or foreign law degree, and then CLP, or UK law degree, and then doing the UK bar exam, right? Um, with us at ATC, the second route is what you can do with us completely, right? So, at ATC, what we'll be able to do is uh, right after your, your, your SPM or your O-level exams, right? Right after that, or your UEC exams, you join us, do a pre-university program with us, foundation, do the degree, three years, do the CLP, all with us, and then we will send you off into pupillage, uh, almost a qualified lawyer, right? Okay, next, let me talk to you about the legal profession in general, right, ladies and gentlemen? Obviously, we don't have uh, that much time to get into the nitty gritties of the legal profession. But uh, in general, right, in general, the legal profession can be, in Malaysia, can be divided into three, right, three. 
Number one, litigation. Number two, corporate. And number three, conveyancing. Now, at this point, I want to get back to a point that I spoke about earlier uh, with regard to uh, personalities, right? Um, a lot of people have a sort of a misconception or they have a, a perception that you need to be of a certain type of personality. You need to be a certain type of person to be a lawyer, right? So the common misconception that I've heard, uh, you need to be a very well-spoken person. Uh, you need to be a, uh, an aggressive personality. You need to be uh, someone that is uh, unafraid of uh, taking on uh, people, things like that, right? Um, all these are, of course, very good. But you see, the legal profession is wide enough to accommodate all types of personalities, right? So if you are there, you are a student, you're sitting there and you're thinking, look, um, in class, I am not the type that likes to answer questions. Uh, when I'm with my friends, I'm the quietest. I, I, I don't really like to, to, to speak like what you are doing now, uh, Daniel. Uh, I, it's not something I enjoy doing, right? I'm very afraid of public speaking. But I enjoy the law. I like to read about the law. I like to read about constitutional matters. I like to read about criminal matters. I think I have an aptitude for the law, but I don't have the personality for law. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here to tell you that that is not uh, the most important thing, right? That is not something that should stop you from pursuing a degree in law. Why? Because like I said, the legal profession is quite neatly divided and, and it kind of uh, allows an opportunity for, for, for many types of people. So let's start off with litigation. Obviously, litigation is the most obvious uh, branch of the legal profession. You've seen this in movies, you see this in courts all the time, where the lawyers wear the robes and the, and the suits and, uh, and the bibs or the ties, and they go to court, they stand up in front of a judge, they make an argument, uh, they present their case, they cross-examine witnesses, they examine witnesses, right? This is litigation. Litigation can be in, 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 in any area. So there can be a, a corporate litigation, there can be family litigation, divorces and such, criminal litigation, right? Uh, intellectual property litigation. So litigation is a skill or a branch of the uh, profession that uh, can be, and you can litigate in any area, right? Okay, then there are corporate lawyers, right? Now, corporate lawyers, um, their role is uh, very, as the name would suggest, right? Deal with a lot of corporate matters, uh, specifically. You see all these uh, uh, initials that are put in the slide. The m and is uh, mergers and acquisitions. When one company uh, buys another company, you need lawyers to help you sort it out. IPOs are initial public offerings, right? That means when you want to list your company in the stock market you need lawyers to help you out right due diligence if you want to do a search about the liabilities of a company let's say for example you are looking to buy a company or you're looking to invest in a company you want it done properly that's due diligence and advisory right advisory advisory is for um let's say big companies want to start a business in another country or they want to start a business, a branch of their business in Malaysia. What are their liabilities? What can they do? What can they not do? So the corporate lawyer will prepare an opinion, is what it's called, right? An opinion, a legal opinion, and, and send it to them so that they will be well advised of their rights, right? They will be well advised of their rights uh, when they do something. So that's corporate work. And lastly, there's also conveyancing, right? So, so what's conveyancing, right? Conveyancing is uh, lawyers that deal with uh, sale and purchase of uh, documents, right? Sale and purchase of, uh, sorry, sale and purchase of property. So they deal with the sale and purchase documents. Um, they are not necessarily needed in court so much. And even if any of the documents that they have prepared uh, needs to be litigated upon, they can then transfer or, or engage a litigation lawyer. So again, what's the point of this slide? The point of this is simply to say that uh, if you feel that you are someone that is not 
uh, suited for going to court and, and, and doing something, you know, uh, putting up an argument in front of a judge, then, ladies and gentlemen, you can do corporate work. Corporate work, there's very little court work, right? Uh, or conveyancing, even less court work, in my opinion, right? So there is um, room in the profession. So that's what I'm trying to say, right? There is room in the profession for all types of people, all types of personalities. As long as you enjoy the law, you have an aptitude for the law, right? And you'd be surprised. Most people do. Okay, let's let's take a look at this. Uh, especially if you are someone who has just finished your SPM exams or O levels, uh, the the question on everybody's mind is, uh, what is the pathway? What what do I need to do to reach my goal of becoming a lawyer? So at SPM level or O levels, right? If that's what you've done, you need a minimum of five credits. Now, this is to do the University of London program here with ATC. So as you can see, this slide is specifically talking about the law program that you are able to uh, get at ATC if you are interested. You need a minimum of five credits. So let me, let me talk about this uh, for a while. Every time I explain this, uh, people get very surprised and they ask me things like, oh, is that, is that true? Uh, can I be a lawyer? I thought to be a lawyer, my marks must be must be uh, very high, must be very good. Surely I, I need a 10 A's or 9 A's or something like that. You're right. 9 A's or 10 A's is good and you will probably, uh, uh, it will be good for you on the law degree. But because the program that we are offering at ATC is, a, is what we call a, an external program, right? Meaning... You don't actually go to the university to study. You can study it anywhere. So you can study it at ATC. And the degree that you will get is a University of London degree, a UK law degree. So because of that, and because there are no space constraints at the university, the university uh, allows anyone with a minimum aptitude to do the degree program. Uh, the quality is maintained because not everybody who starts on the program will finish the program, obviously. But anyone who has the minimum standards and who is interested will not be denied a chance to study. That's the policy of the University of London. That's the ethos of the University of London. And they've been doing it for, for close to 170 years now, right? The University of London was the first university to offer distance learning. The University of London was the first university to offer degree programs to women, right, to, to non-white uh, men. So the University of London has long had a history of being inclusive, right? And that, ladies and gentlemen, explains the, 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 the entry requirements, right? Let, let's get back to this, right? So you will need uh, five credits. Where is my, yeah. So you'll need five credits. You must have a credit in DM as well, Basel, Malaysia. Even if you did O levels, there is a Malay paper that you could have done. So once you're done with the SPM, then you'll move on to the STPM or the uh, uh, or equivalent, right? And what are the recognized equivalents? Ladies and gentlemen, follow me closely on this. The recognized equivalents are the A levels program. Uh, Singapore A levels is also recognized, but uh, usually it's the UK A levels. Uh, foundation programs, uh, a recognized diploma, right? These are all programs that are recognized for the purposes of becoming or doing the law degree. Now, this is where you can start your journey with us at ATC. So instead of doing the STPM in school, which you can, right? Not a problem. If you chose to do the STPM, you will need two credits, which is a C or better. C minus won't be accepted, right? Uh, but other than that, if you, if you chose not to do the STPM, you can join us and do the foundation program. You can join us and do the uh, A-Levels program, right? Uh, we, of course, highly recommend our foundation program. We've got a foundation in law. This foundation in law prepares you well for the law degree. This foundation in law prepares you well to, to, to get ready, right, to, to move into undergraduate law studies, right, undergraduate law studies. Um, it's a one-year course. And once you finish the foundation in law here with us, then you can move on to do your uh, degree. 
But if you decide not to do your foundation and you want to do A levels, perfectly fine. You can do that with us as well. Or let's say, for example, some of you may have diplomas and you started working for a while, you know, for whatever reason, for financial reasons or lack of opportunity. So you've worked for a few years, you've got some money, you want to continue studying. You didn't do A-levels or STPM, but you've got a diploma in even business, a diploma in uh, graphic design, a diploma in uh, culinary arts or whatever, right? As long as it's a recognized diploma, you can use that to enter into the law degree. The, the university recognizes that diploma as a pre-university equivalent. Right, so we've spoken about the STPM and the STPM. Let's move on. So obviously, after you finish your STPM or STPM equivalent, then you start on the law degree. The law degree that you, we offer here at ATC is the University of London Bachelor of Laws degree that is done entirely externally, meaning you do it here with us at ATC, right? But the degree that you will get is a degree from the University of London. Now, do me a favor, after this session, go and look up the University of London, and you will find that it is an extremely prestigious university, and we will be talking a little bit more about the University of London uh, shortly in my presentation uh, as well. Now, if you choose to do the University of London degree, then obviously uh, it's a three-year course, I've put in my slide four years is uh, if you've chosen to do another degree, let's say from Australia, Australian degrees are sometimes four years and some dual degree programs in Australia are five years, right? They're all recognized as well, right? For the purposes of doing the uh, becoming a lawyer in Malaysia. Okay, so if you've done this ATC route with me, then at this point, what you have is you have a UK law degree from the University of London. Does that make you a lawyer? No, right? At this point, you are a graduate. You have a degree in law, but you are not a lawyer yet. So what do you need to do? You need to do a postgraduate qualification, the professional qualification. In Malaysia, this professional qualification is called the CLP exams, the Certificate in Legal Practice. You can do this CLP with us as well, right? At ATC. So now this CLP, what, what, what is the reason for that you have to sit for the CLP exam? Now, the reason is quite simply this. Uh, everyone with a recognized foreign degree, and it's not Malaysian law degree, you need to sit for the CLP exam. Because in the CLP, what you will learn is you will learn Malaysian court procedure. Uh, well, number one, you don't really learn court procedure at undergraduate but you definitely wouldn't have learned Malaysian court procedure in a UK law degree, right? So it's uh, the CLP exam is to prepare you for practice in Malaysia. But as I told you earlier, if you choose not to do the CLP, the Certificate in Legal Practice, you can also then go on to do the UK bar exam, which means that you qualify to be a barrister in the UK, right? You qualify to be a barrister in the UK. Um, you, you can, uh, right after doing your degree with us here in ATC, you can apply to do the bar exam and you can go on to do it in the UK. The bar exam must be done in the UK, uh, quite obviously, right? Okay, so once you're done with your CLP or you're done with your bar exams, then comes pupillage, right? Uh, we spoke a little bit about pupillage earlier, right? Uh, sometimes you may have heard your friends or your seniors who are doing law uh, they may have referred to it as, referred to it as chambering, right? Uh, yes, uh, in Malaysia, sometimes this, word, uh, this term is called chambering as well, but the proper term for it is pupillage. You are a pupil in chambers. That's the term, right? You're a pupil in chambers. Now, why? Why is this there? A lot of people have asked me, is this like an internship? I suppose if you had to put a label to it, yeah, it is an internship, but the difference being uh, that you must comply, you must do this pupillage before you can be a lawyer, right? Uh, the pupillage period is absolutely vital and important because when you be when you become a lawyer, you literally are dealing with people's lives, especially in Malaysia, because we still have the death penalty, right? 
so you could be uh, defending a person who has been charged with a crime that the punishment could be mandatory death, right? You could be dealing with a case where your client is uh, um, stands to lose uh, millions of ringgit, tens of millions of ringgit, right? So if you are fresh out of college or university and you haven't had any practical knowledge yet, you are going to struggle in practice. So the entire legal profession is designed in a way that uh, you must have some element of practical knowledge, right? There's some history to this as well, if you are at all interested, right? A long time ago, uh, there were no, you didn't need to go to university to be a lawyer. You just needed to have a, pre, uh, uh, a lawyer accept you as a pupil and you worked for him for many, many years and then you became a lawyer. Uh, this is a long time ago. We're talking 300 and 400 years ago, right? That's how lawyers were trained. But now you have to go to university, you get a degree, and then that element of that practical training is still so important that it is still retained. So that's the nine months you have to do. And then once you finish that, ladies and gentlemen, you are then called to the Malaysian bar, right? You are what is known as an advocate and solicitor of the High Court of Malaya. Now, if you are called in Semenanjung, Malaysia, uh, or the peninsula of Malaysia, then uh, you will be an advocate and solicitor of the High Court of Malaya. Yes, I'm saying it right. It's not a typo. It's not Malaysia. It's the High Court of Malaya. If you are called to the bar in either the Sabah or Sarawak High Courts, then you will be an advocate and solicitor of the High Court of Sabah and Sarawak, right? In Malaysia, what we have is what we call a fused profession. A fused profession means that all lawyers are both advocates and solicitors. In the UK, it's a, it's a separated profession. So you train to become either a barrister or an advocate, right? Or you train to become a solicitor. Right. Now, this is all very interesting stuff. And if you want uh, more explanation of this, you can ask questions and I'll be happy to uh, uh, explain a little bit further on that. Okay, so very quickly, just to summarize what I've just been telling you, right? If you chose to start with us in July 2020 on the foundation program, right? If you chose to start with us uh, uh, July 2020 on the foundation program, you will start the degree in September 2021 because the foundation program is a one year course. Then this degree course is three years, right? So it's three years. So you will start, you will finish that in 2024, August. And once you've cleared that, you are a degree holder, you will start the CLP in September of 2024. That's a one year course. Uh, you will complete that somewhere in uh, June, July. You will get your results by. September of the following year, 2025. And if you pass, you can immediately start your pupillage in October 2025. And ladies and gentlemen, you can be an advocate and solicitor of the High Court of Malaya by August 2026. That's right, right? It is, uh, it seems like a long uh, and a far away uh, goal right now, but it's a very, very achievable goal, ladies and gentlemen. Start now. Right, start now. Join us on the found uh, for to take the first step and do the foundation program in July with us. And in August 2026, if you study hard, if you do all the necessary work and you pass all your exams, you will be a lawyer, right? A fully qualified lawyer in the High Court of Malaya. Okay, let, let's address a few uh, a few myths, right? Uh, usually associated with the law degree. I want to just touch on that uh, very quickly, right? Um, do I have to read and memorize a lot? Well, <laughs> there's no degree that you don't have to read, I'm assuming, right? Uh, so yeah, you have to read and memorize, but in my opinion, it's no more than any other professional degree, right? If you want something good, you want something useful, there's some work involved. But the point I'm making is, it's not a pure memory exam. And that's a mistake a lot of people make. 
it's not a pure memory exam. It's not just about memorizing dates and memorizing uh, uh, cases and things. Like that. It's not. It's not. The skills you learn from a law degree are skills that will enable you to use the law. That is what you take away from the law degree. No, nobody comes out of a law degree having every single law in their head. That, that's just silly because laws are so easily available. You buy a book. You buy the statute, you read the law, it's all on your phone now, it's all on your computers. So it's not a memory exam, it's not a memory test. The skill that you develop as uh, after getting a law degree is the ability to understand a law, to read it, understand it, because law has a language of its own, right? to read it, to understand it, and then to use it and to apply it. That's the skill you learn from a law degree. Must my language skills be very good? Look, um, language words are the tools of the trade for a lawyer. But if you are sitting there thinking, oh, English is not my first language. Malay is not my first language. I, I don't think I get proper, uh, my proper grammar. Uh, my Malay is not so good, right? Don't worry. After having done a three-year law degree, inevitably your language skills get better. Inevitably, right? Inevitably, right? And once again, this is not an English exam. It's a law exam. The examiners, right, at the University of London, the people who are marking your exam paper, are not too concerned about how uh, well you, you you phrase your sentences, what uh, language, uh, what language you what words you use, uh, what fancy Shakespearean language you use or something like that. They're not too concerned with that. As long as you are able to use the language in a way to convey what you're trying to say, that's enough. That's it. So don't be put off. Don't worry. Don't sit there in the corner thinking, oh, my English is no good. Um, and so I can't be a lawyer. That, that's, that's absolutely ridiculous. Like I said, good language skills help, but it doesn't mean that you cannot be a good lawyer if you don't speak English well, right? Uh, must I have an aggressive personality or must I be someone who's very sociable or like to talk to people? Um, no, we addressed this earlier. There is enough room in the legal profession for all types of personalities, right? I don't like to go to court. Can I still be a lawyer? Yes, we also addressed this earlier. Remember, there are branches of the legal profession or areas that you can focus on where you hardly ever go to court. Next question. What if I don't understand the law and the cases? That's what we are here for at APC, right? We have been doing this for more than 30 years and we know how to, uh, well, how to make you understand what you need to understand and how to get you uh, the best education that you can get. What if I fail my exam? Ladies and gentlemen, failure shouldn't be um, feared, right? Failure shouldn't be feared. What you should fear is failing and not coming back from that failure. So effectively what we're saying is, look, sometimes it happens. Even to the best of lawyers that, that are out there in practice now, if you ask them, I'm sure there are more than a few that have failed a few papers here and there along the way in their degree, right? If you fail, the University of London program is flexible enough that it allows you to just resit the paper that you have failed so you don't lose a year. You don't lose time, right? You can resit the paper the same year in October. The main exams are in June, uh, in October, and you can move on if you have passed it the second time. You never have to do a paper that you have passed again. Okay, very quickly, very quickly. Um, let me introduce you to the University of London. Please uh, go back after this. If you, uh, if you enjoyed the talk, go and uh, check out the University of London. I will give you the website at the end of this chat. The University of London, like I told you earlier, is uh, the first university to offer degrees at distance, starting in 1858. And it was established earlier by Royal Charter. This is a university that's been around for a very long time, and it is an extremely prestigious university. Now, like many of these older universities, 
um, they are a consortium or they are an amalgamation of many colleges and the University of London colleges you will find are, are colleges that are top schools on their own right. For example, King's College is a University of London um, component college. Uh, Queen Mary University of uh, it's a University of London component college. The London School of Economics and Political Science, LSC as it's commonly known, is a University of London component college. Uh, SOAS, School of uh, Oriental and African Studies, University of London, you see, right? And you, ladies and gentlemen, if you join us, you will be a University of London degree holder, right? And the university guarantees, ladies and gentlemen, let me, uh, let me assure you uh, to this point here, the university guarantees that if you have obtained a degree from the University of London, regardless of your mode of study or place of study, you have the same quality assured in your degree. All potential employers will know when they see the University of London stamp on your degree, they know that you have come up to the same standards as if you had gone to any one of those component colleges I told you earlier, right? Right. So th this is a good thing, right? So among the, the value of you doing your law degree with us at APC, is that you can finish the entire law degree here and you don't have to go to the UK at all and still graduate with a UK law degree. I'm going to take two minutes here to talk about degree transfer programs. Uh, degree transfer programs are great, but once you once you join a degree transfer program or a UK transfer program, so maybe a two plus one or a one plus two, right? Three years here, one year in the UK. You must go to the UK. You must. You can't finish it here. After that, let's say for example something happens and there's a financial issue, you can't finish it here. You must go to the UK. The University of London program, ladies and gentlemen, affords you this this flexibility. You can either choose to finish it entirely here in the in Malaysia at ATC and get a UK law degree, or after two years, or one year, you can transfer to another UK university. Uh, it will just be seen as transferring from one school to another school, because even though you're studying with us here in ATC in Malaysia, it is actually a UK law degree that you are studying for, right? Okay, uh, then a few words about ATC. ATC has been around for a long time, ladies and gentlemen, right? They've been around since 1987. We've got campuses in KL and Penang. So if you are from the northern part uh, of uh, Samananjung, Malaysia, uh, Kedah, Perlis, uh, even the northern part of Perak, then you should get in touch with our Penang school, right? We also offer uh, the law degree there. But if you are not, and you are, you know, the southern part of Perak, Selangor, KL, maybe even Johor, the East Coast, Sabah and Sarawak, give us a call in KL, right? We have graduate, we have sent so many, more than 10,000 uh, uh, law graduates into practice or into a variety of uh, fields that they are in, right? Um, we have had outstanding results on the University of London program. This University of London program is at is an extremely prestigious program. And so getting good marks on the program is something that is sought after very much. And here at ATC, right, we, we do it for you. Uh, these are some very quickly, uh, some pictures of our, of our college. We are in the process of moving to new premises. Uh, it'll be bigger, nicer. But in the meantime, this is our current uh, building, right? This is our current building. Can just take a look at our computer lab. This is our computer lab. Uh, this is our moot court, right? A moot court is where we do a trial, a mock trial, right? Mock trials. This is also to train your advocacy skills, right? To be able to present arguments to a panel of judges. It's a very important skill to develop, right? Uh, these are some of the facilities. This is one of our classrooms here, our lecture theater at uh, ATC, right? Um, okay, I won't bore you with all these uh, statistics, but if you were interested, please let me know and uh, I can send you. These are our, our top students for, for, for many, many years who have done extremely well 
on the University of London program. This is the Malaysian Law Scholarship, ladies and gentlemen. The Malaysian Law Scholarship is, is awarded to one Malaysian, one Malaysian every year who is the best year one law student in the country. ATC has won the most, ATC students have won the most number of these scholarships, right? Have won the most number of these scholarships. That just goes to show you the quality that we offer here because to be the single best student in the entire year one of the University of London program in Malaysia is a big deal. Okay, um, we are nearing the end of my presentation now, right? I just wanted to tell you that at ATC, we offer a variety of scholarships on merit. So I don't know if this is clear and you can uh, you can see what I've put on the board. But if you can't, please get in touch with us and we'll be happy to send this to you, right? Um, we, we have scholarships for, for SPM levers. If you have eight A's and above, seven A's, six A's, A levels, STPM, UEC, so on and so forth, right? So if you have good results, come and see us. If you have good results, come and see us. We will be happy to make your dreams come true. But today I want to take a few minutes to talk about this. ATC cares. ATC cares. So things have been tough in Malaysia, right? Things have been tough. So what ATC has decided is that we have started a scholarship fund. If you are from the B40 community, meaning that your family income is 4,000 ringgit and below. I repeat that. Huh? If your family income is 4,000 ringgit and below, come and see us. We will give you a 100% scholarship of our course fee. Right? So if there's any external fees to be paid, you still need to pay. Uh, registration fee, you still need to pay. But the bulk of your fees, which is the ATC course fee, you don't have to pay. This is just our way of giving back to society. This is our way of helping Malaysians during this tough time, right? So call us to find out more about ATC Cares, right? Um, yeah, so that's the end of my talk. I think uh, uh, I was given 45, 40 minutes and I've gone to 45 minutes already. So right here on the slide is uh, my name, my email address, the website of ATC, the website of the University of London, right? So if you are watching us, please go to our Facebook page, go to our Instagram page, uh, follow us there, like us, so that you will be updated with what we're doing here, right? Um, yeah, I think that's the end of my uh, session today, right? So. Hi, Mr. Daniel, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, I can. Yeah, all right. Uh, trying to figure out how to stop this. Okay, good. Yeah, I already removed it from the stream. All right, so we are now nearing the end of the session. Mr. Daniel, you were very, very comprehensive with your explanation. Um, let's take a look to see if there are any questions from our audience. I think, Mr. Daniel, you can see the questions on the side. It's just right underneath the Edu Advisor comment. Do you want to choose which question you'd like to answer or shall we go through all of them? I haven't, uh, I haven't seen the, oh, okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, right. so the live, live comment section there, yeah. Sure, okay, so, so the, there's one, comments, yes, yeah. yes, oh, no, yes, some there's of them, which one are we looking at, Mr. Daniel, the first one? This one, here. Well, you gotta scroll down, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, sure, Nadine, yeah. yeah. Let's say if I want to be a judge after I pass everything and qualify, do I be a judge after that? Do I need to work as a lawyer? Um, no, you cannot be a judge immediately, right? In order to be a judge, you need a, a lot of experience as a, as a practitioner first. However, in Malaysia, in Malaysia, what you can do is you can join the AG's chambers. That means you join the service, right? Join the AG's chambers. And when I say AG, I mean the Attorney General, right? So you join the Attorney General's chambers and there you can be a magistrate. A magistrate is like a judge, but technically we can't call you a judge. It's a, it's a, it's a, you're a judge at the, one of the lower courts, right? So you can be a magistrate first and then you work hard. You can get promoted to be a Sessions Court judge, 
then you move on into the judiciary, which is the uh, uh, high court judge. But if you choose, if you don't choose that route, and you wanna you wanna go straight to become a high court judge, you can't. You can't. You must have at least uh, uh, ten to fifteen years of practice before you will even be considered, right? So if you did want to be a judge straight away, then yeah, the attorney general's chambers is a good avenue. And once you're there. You will apply to become a magistrate, but it's not necessarily that uh, you will get to be a magistrate immediately. Uh, they may make you a prosecutor first. They may make you a, a federal counsel. So that's one way. Yes. All right. Okay. So I hope uh, Nadine have you know know how that she can have to uh, go through the magistrate now to become a judge. Let's answer the next one from Naomi Hui. I'm just gonna show it up on the screen. Yeah, Mr. Daniel. Okay, that's great. Uh, All right. May I ask if you would like to study overseas and work in Malaysia, what route would that be, CLP or BPPC? Well, that depends. Uh, at which point do you want to study in the UK? So uh, a good thing to do, in my opinion, is do the degree in Malaysia and then do the BPTC in the UK. Right? Because if you ask me between the BPTC and the CLP, uh, I think the BPTC is, uh, provides you with better training right the law degree is pretty much the same because even if you study here in malaysia you're studying for uk law degree right so do the degree here and then go and do the vtpc i think that would be a good way of doing it if you wanted to do one year in the uk mm -hmm. obviously you don't have to you can do your entire uk law degree here in malaysia and then do your clp in malaysia and still start practice right all right okay okay um there's another one here by Casey t it's very long but i'm just gonna pull it up into the uh, stream oh okay so she has okay, four questions <laughs> okay let me try what is the likeliness of getting hired as a lawyer overseas okay let's address that first right mm -hmm. um look it depends on your qualifications Law is different from other fields in the sense that uh, it's unique to each country, right? So every country has its own requirements. Every country has its own uh, jurisdiction. So let's say, for example, if you did a Australian law degree, uh, you you can't take an Australian law degree and go and practice in, in Japan. Let's say mm. so the system is entirely different in Japan. Now, it is a lot more transferable in Commonwealth countries. Because we all right. follow pretty much the same system, right? Uh, right, system. right. So that is why in Malaysia, even though you do the UK bar qualification, you still can practice in Malaysia. But my mm -hmm. answer to your to your question, uh, Cassie, is uh, it may not be a satisfactory answer, but the answer is it really depends. You need to do research on every country that you think that you want to practice in. So let's say, for example, mm -hmm. you want to practice in Hong Kong. Find out what are the requirements for Hong Kong. You want to practice in Australia. Find out what are the requirements in Australia so that you take the right steps during your degree. Because you may have worked hard and done the University of London degree or some other university degree only to find that uh, it's not recognized in that particular country. So with law, there is no universal uh, rule that you can follow. Okay, Cassie's second question. Mm -hmm. Is it really possible to become a lawyer without SPM qualifications? Well, yeah, it's possible. But in Malaysia, um, in Malaysia, you can. Uh, as long as you have an SP, uh, equivalent to SPM, which is the O level. So you can, right? But you must have a, a Malay paper in your O levels or SPM. Mm -hmm. You must have that. Number three. So again, let me just come back to question number two so that there's no confusion. All right. I'm not saying that uh, you don't, that means if you fail your SPM, you can be a lawyer. No. So if you didn't do, if you fail your SPM, that's fine. You do your SPM again, or you be, you do your old levels. So it's one or the other, right? You, mm -hmm. If you don't have any, you cannot be a lawyer. Okay? What is the reality of being a lawyer? Oh, that's, a, mm -hmm. that's an extremely wide question. Okay, yeah. so let me tell, tell you this. For me, this is the reality of being a lawyer. I was in practice before as well, right? 
Mm-hmm. I think when you are a lawyer, you have the tools to actually do something other than just sitting around and complaining. Sometimes we are angry with people, we are angry with the government, we are angry with our neighbor, we are angry with this and angry. And what do we do? We rant on social media, again, right? Mm-hmm. But that, that, that counts for nothing. I, I, I've got very little respect for people who rant on social media with no uh, basis, right? So the point is this, if you have a law degree and you're qualified as a lawyer, you now have the ability and the skill mm-hmm. to do something about it. You can take an action against the government. If you see someone abusing someone who is uh, maybe less educated or not as rich or not as powerful, you can help that person. It's within your power to help, and you can. And that's mm-hmm. why this degree is a it's a it's a good one. It's a wonderful one. The the, yeah. the skills that you will get is, is extremely useful. Mm-hmm. What are the types of lawyers and various work required to be done by each? Uh, Cassie, I'm going to skip this question because uh, yeah. I addressed this in uh, detail during my uh, talk as well. So I'm sure you can catch the video on yeah. this page. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, because um, all these questions that we received from under Edu Advisor were questions that we collected yesterday and this morning. Sure, sure. So I think it's prior prior to the uh, interview. All right. So let's just jump to our yeah. Let's just jump to one question here by. Irisa Chai Ling. She's not doing her history in IGCSE. Does she, does she need to take a subject to be able to study law in the UK, preferably? No, you don't. No, you don't. Right? Most UK universities as well, uh, they just require a certain number of uh, IGCSEs. There's no subject yeah. required. This learning history to study law thing is a, is a myth. <laughs> it's not true. You don't need it. You could do five science papers and still do a law degree, not a problem. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oops. All right. Okay. So let's just do another one from William Tong. Yeah, this is a very specific question. Okay. Uh, William Tong. So diploma in law enforcement. So um, I don't know if you are in any kind of uh, law enforcement agency like the police or the NACC or whatever, right? But yeah, the answer to your question is yes. If you do a diploma in law enforcement, and can I emphasize that it is a recognized diploma by the MQA, the Malaysian Qualifying uh, Qualifications Agency, then you can start on the law degree right after that, right? In 2021, you can start, right? Is law high in demand in Malaysia? My answer is yes, right? And we spoke about this earlier as well. You don't just need to be a lawyer, right? You can do so many other things with the law degree. And since you're already going in this field of law enforcement, if you have a law degree, you will you can join the police force and you will immediately be an inspector, right? Mm-hmm. So with a law degree, you join as an officer. So you don't have to work your way up rank and file, right? So that's something useful. So. The fact that you're doing a diploma in law enforcement kind of tells me that that may be uh, an area that you are interested in. Uh, so yeah, do the degree, go on to become a lawyer, yes. But if not, you can be a policeman. You can be uh, uh, you can serve in so many ways, right? All right. Okay, and we have one last question here by Alan okay. Alan Gunn. Is there a period in which you must finish your degree? And here's another one here that says, like in a maximum number of years. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, there is. You can't keep studying forever. Uh, you must complete your degree uh, within uh, seven years. Mm, right, the, right. The, the minimum is three years, but the university mm-hmm. gives you up to seven years. And then on certain special circumstances, if you really need to appeal for further time, you can, right? Now, this is okay. something to think about because the degree can be done part-time as well, right? So if you wanted to take a longer time, you could, yeah? But uh, seven years is the most. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are hearing any interruption, but the birds in my housing area are going off right now. <laughs> It's very, very loud. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Daniel, for sharing with us. 
for um you know giving us an insight of what it's like to be a lawyer in Malaysia and how do you actually proceed to do to become one and also the variety of uh, uh career options under this particular field uh well sorry mr alam gun has uh, just oh, added one another more thing question. Oh, okay. Uh, okay let's just go ahead. yeah so can i just very quickly say that uh, yeah i mean even if you are an okeu please feel free don't, don't feel that you are disadvantaged especially in a degree in law and depending on what type of uh, disability you have you can get special concessions from the university as well when you're doing exams right yeah. uh, so come and speak to us if you are interested right all right there you have it alan um there obviously is no stopping for anyone who wants to pursue law there's no limitations or whatsoever so if there's anything you guys can go ahead and speak to Mr. Daniel or just go ahead to APC and visit their booth at our virtual education fair. So thank you so much, Mr. Daniel, for your, your insights and perspective. We hope that our, our audience has gained some valuable information from this session. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Daniel. We hope that we get to see you again for our next webinar as always. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I always enjoy my time at the uh, EduAdvisor. Right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.